Hi, I'm Gianluca Garofalo from the German Aerospace Center. In this video, recorded for ACC 2020, I will present a new technique developed in order to combine multiple controllers for a robotic system. The presentation is organized in six parts. First, I will use a very simple example in order to motivate why it is important to combine a local and a global controller. And I will clarify what's the meaning of both the local and global controller later. Then I'll move to the adaptive variance algorithm, which I had previously introduced and it's used here in order to obtain the uniting controller. We will then have a look at the proposed control scheme, which goes under the category of uniting controllers. We will also quickly go through the steps needed in order to prove the stability of the proposed control screen. After the proof, we will see the controller in action with some experiments. And finally, I will summarize the presentation and give some hints for future works. Okay, so let's start considering a very simple system, just an integrator with state C and input U. The goal would be to globally asymptotically stabilize the origin of the system. A proportional action is a very popular choice in this case. It will lead to a linear time variant system for which we know pretty much every single property. Still, since this is a proportional action, the control input will go pretty large if we start very far from the goal. The situation is quite similar when we consider a robotic system, since typically the control action consists in connecting the robot to the goal to a spring and endeavor. Therefore, the farther is the goal, the stronger is the control action. Since the value of the stiffness and damper are typically given by the desired compliance that we want to realize, what I typically do then when the goal is too far is to drive the robot closer to the goal and then activate the desired compliant behavior. We see then that there are two different requirements the behavior of the robot when we are far from the goal and the behavior of the robot when we are closer to the goal. The first one will be targeted by the global controller, while the second one will be targeted by the local controller. Additionally, I will show you a way that allows us to smoothly transition between the global and the local controller and the other way around, rather than switching between the two, depending on the distance to the goal. If now we go back to the integrator system, the goal is not only to have a globally asymptotically stable system, but also to realize a smooth transition between a high gain and a low gain, in such a way that the proportional action will not lead to high control input when far away from the goal. In this presentation, this is realized by using a Gaussian function with an adaptive variance. The proportional action gets then modified by multiplying it via a not normalized Gaussian function. And its variance becomes an internal state of the controller that gets updated depending on the distance from the goal. But at this point, rather than going more into the details of the equation, I believe that a short animation will clarify much more what's the effect of the control action. In the top right corner, we see in orange the current value of the state. As the initial value is far from the desired goal, the control gain is pretty low. But at the same time, the variance of the Gaussian will start increasing. As a consequence, also the gain of the control action will increase and the state will start approaching the desired goal. And as the state approaches the desired value, the variance of the Gaussian starts also shrinking back to its original value. In the lower plot instead, we see that in this case, the input doesn't grow larger and larger when we get farther and farther from the origin. Finally, the plot on the left shows the trajectory in the state space. I will not go in the details of the meaning of the blue and the red region, but I just want to say that they are used in order to obtain bounds 
in the stability proof. When considering the robot, we want once again to obtain the same features we just saw for the integrator. Therefore, the origin of the state space has to be globally asymptotically unstable. And in addition, we want smooth transition between high and low gains. At this point, I will have to assume that you know what is a slotted variable and how it is used in the slotting and Lee control law. The idea is that the robotic system is a second order system, while so far with the integrator, we consider a first order system. Therefore, I will introduce the variable S, such that when S is zero, we will once again obtain a bunch of integrator system. In fact, the matrix E in the equation is nothing else but a diagonal matrix with not normalized Gaussians on the diagonal. Therefore, when S is zero, we obtain N integrator systems where N is the number of degrees of freedom of the robot. The next observation is quite important. In fact, so far, we've only considered this proportional action with a gain that is high close to the goal and tends towards zero when we're far from the goal. Therefore, it's a perfect example of a local control action. If we want to combine this local control action to a global controller, we can consider the following convex combination. In here, I is the identity matrix. And as we know, the not normalized Gaussian has also values between zero and one. So when the Gaussian is almost zero, the local controller is negligible and the global controller VG1 is the active one. On the other hand, when the Gaussian is around one, the global controller is almost negligible and the local controller is the active one. If you recall from the Slotin and the controller, at this point we have to introduce the reference velocity, CR, which is then used to write down the complete control law. The first three terms of the control law are related to the dynamic equations, while the last two are once again a convex combination of a local controller, specifically a proportional action, and a global controller, BG2. At this point, we can write the closed loop system, where we can once again notice how the use of the variable S was instrumental in order to rewrite the second order system as the cascaded interconnection of two first order systems. Of these, the second one is very much related to the integrator system we saw before, except for two differences. The first is the appearance of the global controller VG1, and the second is the additional input provided by the variable S. The presence of S is actually not a big problem because it will converge to a zero. And this is due to the fact that if we look at the first two equations, they are once again similar to the integrator system seen before. But this time we also have the appearance of, of the matrices N and C. You might have noticed that unlike for the local controller, I didn't really specify what the global controllers should be. And that's because the conditions on the global controllers are not very strict. This is also reflected in the stability proof from which we can safely remove the presence of the global controllers. Therefore, we will only consider the following simplified closed loop system. For the stability proof, it's useful to look at the system as a cascaded interconnection of two subsystems. The highlighted one has an input S coming from the previous subsystem. When S is zero, it consists of N decoupled globally asymptotically stable systems. Although the other subsystem has in addition the matrices M and C, it can still be shown to be uniform globally asymptotically stable. And that's because it's the interconnection of a uniform globally asymptotically stable system and an input to state stable system. 
The last step of the proof consists in showing that the system is uniformly globally bounded. At this point, in fact, using all the properties that we have shown so far, we can finally conclude that the overall system is uniformly globally asymptotically stable. We come now to what is maybe the most interesting part of the presentation. We will see the behavior of the control law when applied to the humanoid robot Toro that you see in this video. In this and the next experiment, the control law is only applied to the right arm of the robot. The rest of the robot is controlled via a balancing framework developed by my colleague George Messechon. Therefore, we will mainly focus our attention to the behavior of the arm. In the video, we command a jump in the desired configuration of the robot arm. Therefore, the robot will move from an initial configuration to a final one. Afterwards, we will ask Toro to go back to its initial configuration. Needless to say, the values of the stiffness and damping chosen to realize the desired compliant behavior with the local controller would be too high when performing such a big movement and therefore the torque limits would interrupt the execution of the task. We can also have a look at the position signals for four of the involved joints. What we can see is that the time response is definitely not the one of a linear system. At the beginning, the joint position increases almost linearly. And this is due to the fact that for our experiments, we chose as our global controller a smooth saturation function. And initially, the global controller is active. As the joints get closer to the desired value, the local controller starts to be the predominant one. And correspondingly, the signal starts assuming the typical shape of a linear system response. The transitions between local and global controllers are quite evident, especially if we look at the values of the non-normalized Gaussian function. For the four joints, we see that when we command the step in the desired joint position, the value of the Gaussian drops to zero, for then increasing back towards one. Correspondingly, we have first the activation of the global controller, and then a smooth transition towards the local controller. In this second example, instead, we want to highlight the difference between our approach and a simple saturation of the joint torque. What happens in this case is that a disturbance could let the robot get stuck away from the desired configuration. And that's because the saturated torque might be perfectly counterbalanced by the external disturbance provided by the additional weight. Using the proposed United controller instead, the variance of the Gaussian will continue to grow until the region in which the local controller is active is big enough to reach the configuration at which the robot goes stuck. And from there, it will start bringing the robot towards the goal. In conclusion, the adaptive variance algorithm is an easy replacement to a proportional state feedback whenever we are interested in limiting the control action when the control error is large. This can be easily achieved by including an additional internal state to the controller, which basically keeps track of the distance between the current state and the desired goal. Based on the adaptive variance algorithm, I've proposed a uniting controller that combines the local controller to a global one. As future steps, an easy extension of the controller would be the use of the nominal compliance not only when the control error approaches zero, but in an entire region. While this extension is pretty straightforward, a more challenging task would be to find conditions that allow the use of different local controllers beside a proportional state feedback. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention, and in case of questions, please don't hesitate to reach out.